miss that noise. Well, guys, the day I thought would never come is finally here. I am no longer a Lotus owner. And I'm quite sad about that. But it's been coming for a little while and I've got no interest in clickbaiting you guys. The deal is done. This car is sold. This is not my car anymore. I think you deserve a fairly decent explanation as to why I've got rid of the car because it's more than just a case of regular YouTube six month aritis. Uh, as you know, I've had this car for just over two years. This is the car that kickstarted the channel. It is the most expensive thing, more or less, that I've ever bought. The only car I'll probably ever buy new. And I've developed a real emotional attachment to it in the last 25,000 miles. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't at least a little bit happy for it to now be gone. So why is this car sold? Well, there's a number of things which have always bugged me from really the day that I picked it up. At the center of my qualms with this car has to be my dealer, JCT 600, also known as Lotus of Leeds. JCT 600 are an absolutely enormous company with different dealerships with different marks all over the north of England. They're basically one of the largest, if not the largest, independently owned dealership in the country. Now, I have no dealings with them beyond their Lotus branch, so I really can't speak for the company as a whole, but their Lotus branch have been pretty damn useless from day one. In truth, my annoyance at them started on the day that I actually picked the car up. Now bear in mind that I was parting with around £70,000, which I paid cash, as in a wire transfer, not like a lunchbox full of money, and they wouldn't pick me up from the station in Leeds. They wanted me to get another train so that they could pick me up from five minutes away rather than 20 minutes away. Come on guys, customer service 101. After that, there was the six month period of just continuous issues with this car. One of the reasons that I bought this car and a Lotus, particularly a new one, was because I wanted to use this channel to dispel the myth of Lotus and their unreliability. Now, I still believe the whole lots of trouble, usually serious bit is, is hogwash and undeserved. I think more appropriate is lots of trouble, usually stupid, because nearly all the problems I had with this car were minor quirks, annoyances, silly things that really should have been picked up during the production and quality control process. You know, leaky window seals, you know, switches that weren't put on straight, silly little stuff, but things that I don't think should be forgivable in a car at any price certainly not one with a list of nearly 80 grand. But I persevered, and I persevered because the car itself was absolutely brilliant. And where JCT failed me, Lotus themselves, the factory, did pick up the slack. And there's a few people there who deserve special mention, Neil Turner in particular, for really helping me to be a Lotus owner for as long as I've chosen to be. And the car is truly brilliant. I get emails from people on a weekly basis saying that I have in some way, shape or form helped them to get into a Lotus, usually an Evora. And if you're watching this video, being one of those people and suddenly thinking, oh my God, have I actually bought the wrong car? Does he really hate it? No, no, not at all. A Lotus Evora is still genuinely a brilliant car. My opinion of the car has not changed in the least. And particularly if you're one of those people lucky enough to own something like a GT430, well, that is just a truly, truly spectacular machine. So, no, the car itself is fantastic, and Lotus's lineup in general is absolutely brilliant at the moment. 
and things generally were going very, very well with the car. I'd sorted out pretty much all my major niggles. We had a few small things. We had some lack of peel issues in a couple of places on the wheels in particular, but that was all resolved by the factory in a decent and timely fashion. And then, a few weeks ago, as you'll have seen on the channel, my supercharger gave up. That wasn't good. And that wasn't good for a couple of reasons. Number one, despite all the problems I'd had with this car, I'd always said that at no point in time did I ever think it would fail to get me somewhere. But that happened and that was a serious issue. Now, I don't really even hold Lotus responsible for that because Lotus don't build the superchargers. Just like many of the parts on this car, it's not really their fault. Now, there were issues with an early batch of superchargers that went to the USA but that's not the issue that I had. We're really not quite sure what actually did go wrong with my supercharger, but it got rebuilt at the factory, and, well, it's working great now, and the car's new owner, I know, is very, very happy with the performance, as he should be. But I was at Stratton Motor Company, as you guys will have seen, for uh, my wheels being done. They're getting these, these lovely light speed wheels put on the vehicle. Uh, which I've got as a demo set from Stefan. If you don't know about these wheels, I did another video on those a little while ago. So I was stuck at Stratton Motor Company just south of Norwich, not far from the Lotus factory as it happens, with a car that was not safe to drive. I had an appointment to keep in a few hours. Stratton themselves had no hire cars. Lotus weren't there because it's Friday afternoon and they go home on a Friday afternoon. I phoned JCT 600 to see if they would be able to help out they didn't even answer the phone and so I was forced to go and hire a car so that I could stay mobile for the week. I hired a Hyundai i40 at a cost of £180. Now I had hoped, no, I had expected that somebody would pick up the tab for that. This is a very expensive car in warranty that failed unexpectedly 180 quid is not a lot of money for a courtesy car. I phoned up JCT to ask if they had reimbursed me and their response was, no, why should that be our problem? That's Lotus's problem to deal with. Personally, I disagree because it isn't Lotus that took my money from me. JCT's attitude was basically because I'd had my car a couple of years, I wasn't their problem. Lotus said that they would see if they could pick up the tab for me and then for whatever reason I was told explicitly that was not going to happen. So I had to pay for my own courtesy car for a week, not a lot of money granted because it wasn't a fancy car, but I had to pay for that. The point of me having a new car, the point of me having a car warranty was that if something goes wrong with it, no costs would be incurred. This is more annoying for me as well because I have spent in the past tens and tens of hours and hundreds of pounds in fuel going backwards and forwards to the Lotus factory to get this car sorted. I've had friends and family give me lifts to Hethel so that I could sort things out and not be an inconvenience to anyone. This is the first time in two years that I demanded or needed a courtesy car while the car was out of action and I feel like an owner that I was failed. That brings me on to my next point. Previous to this car, the most I'd ever spent on a vehicle was about 15 grand and at the time that was a hell of a large amount of money. Now I know plenty of people that have bought cars new from high-end marks, a Porsche, Ferrari, McLaren and the like. And one of the real benefits of doing that is that you then become part of the club, part of the family. And I'd hoped that becoming a Lotus owner would be similar. I used to have a 911 many, many years ago that I actually shared with my mother, a yellow 996, great car. I took it to be serviced at a Porsche main dealer once. And I still get the monthly magazine from Porsche telling me about what they're doing, what's going on, and all sorts of stuff. 
People I know that have bought Ferraris, they get invites to come out to the Formula One, to do track days, to do all sorts of fun and cool things just because you've decided to become a Ferrari owner. One of the reasons I justified to myself buying a brand new Lotus, I knew that I was going to lose a good chunk of money. And I, to be fair, I haven't actually lost that much on this car in comparison to what I could have lost had I bought something else new. I think I've done fairly okay, so I'm not complaining about that. But I invested a significant chunk of money in getting this vehicle, and no one ever really did anything to kind of say, oh, you bought a Lotus, well done, come and do some stuff, you know? Uh, I mean, I'm talking about as an owner. I've been invited and asked to do loads and loads of things off the back of the channel, and that's been wonderful and amazing, and I absolutely do not regret even for a second buying this car because the people I've met and the adventures that I've had have been just phenomenal. I have enough memories for two lifetimes because of this car. Lotus owners and people are just the best. Unfortunately, they have a factory that I feel doesn't support them enough. That is changing. I can see that there are huge things happening at Hethel at the moment, and that's down almost solely to their new Chinese owners, Zhili, I'm told it's pronounced. And there are individuals being hired there, people like Marcus Blake, who I can tell are absolutely working their backsides off to try and make that place the best it can be. Unfortunately, at the moment, they really are still letting themselves down. My friend James, who has his Exige 430, has had a series of problems with that, and that's going to be detailed in a separate video, because that is another case of Lotus, unfortunately, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. I also feel like this is an appropriate time to mention the fact that I haven't had any support for the channel from the Lotus factory. Now, that's up to them. They're reasons are known to themselves. I really am not bothered at this stage. However, I do want to point out that I have received huge amounts of help and support from the dealers, Bell & Colville, Stratum Motor Company, Lotus Silverstone, as well as the owners who've been incredibly helpful and supportive to me and the channel right from when I started. Plus, you've got the many websites out there like the Lotus Forum, Selog, Lotus Talk, who are all great communities and very, very good and active people. And they really do make Lotus ownership a different proposition. I love the fact that when I drive this car around and you see another Lotus, you wave and you know you're going to get a wave back. That's really something quite special. And I know it may really not make one bit of difference to the way that the car drives, but it's something to own, it's just nice. That is something I'm gonna miss. It's not something I'm gonna get in my next car. Yes, I already know what is gonna replace this. When it's gonna appear on the channel, I couldn't say. Are the other things that have sort of always bothered me about the car, and when I bought it, I knew that it wasn't the fastest thing on planet Earth. That never really bothered me too much. If I wanted to go really, really fast for the money that I paid, I could have just bought a Nissan GTR or a 911 Turbo or something. What did bother me more is the fact that this car always fell in first and second, like it was just being held back. And, and that really does bug me probably a lot more than it should do. I mean, this is a 400 horsepower car weighing just over 1,400 kilos, and it never felt it. it. Does sound very good though, that I cannot deny. Lotus do lie about the weight of the car, by the way, and that's something that bugs me really, really badly. They claim it weighs 1,395 kilos. In fact, this particular car weighs about 1,440, and that's in my lightweight seats that do save quite a bit of weight. Yes, I've added some more weight to it in the form of the speakers and a few other upgrades, but this should weigh pretty much about correct for a 400. Now, all manufacturers fudge their weight numbers to some extent or another. That's just a fact of life. However, if you're a company that stakes their reputation on how being light is right, well, I expect you to know how to use scales properly. 
And when they then try and come out with other cars where they claim they've saved weight just by deleting kit, well, that's not the innovative and clever Lotus that I know. It's just a shame and something I hope gets rectified shortly because they never used to do this. All the weights quoted for the Elise and the old Evora were always unusually accurate for manufacturer numbers. So this is a recent habit and something that I fear that Jean-Marc Gallas introduced for reasons known best to him. He's gone now and I think that's probably for the best. It's good to see the company moving forward with its new leadership and really the pace of change at Lotus has been absolutely incredible. I guarantee in about five years time, you're not gonna recognize the company at all. It's gonna be so, so different. And I don't doubt that the cars that they make are going to be a lot better than these ones in nearly every measurable way but I hope they don't lose that special something that these ones have. That's happened to companies before and I hope it doesn't happen with Lotus because whatever I might say or feel, these are truly special cars and some of the very few true driver's cars still available to buy new. So what was it that actually triggered me to sell the car? Well, the supercharger going pop started to make me think because the car's warranty is going to expire next year. And had that happened outside of warranty, that would have been very, very expensive. Added to that, the fact that while I was away in America for a couple of weeks, I had left this car with a good friend of mine, Charlie. He's a Lotus owner and enthusiast, and he absolutely loved driving this around. In fact, when he gave it back to me, he said those immortal words, if you ever think of selling it, let me know. To which my response, of course, was, over my dead body, I'm never ever selling this car. One dead supercharger later, and I was talking to him about what kind of Evora he would want, and I was trying to find him an S or something like that, and he said, no, 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 it's a 400 that I must have. I said, okay, and he said, also, I really, really want one in yellow. And I thought, well, there aren't any for sale. I haven't seen any for sale for quite a while. If you want a yellow 400, well, <laughs> basically, you'd need to buy mine. And Charlie's a private buyer. I was a private seller. He's local to me. He's an enthusiast. And with these kinds of cars, if you get a decent opportunity, to sell your car directly to another enthusiast. That's a very, very rare thing and an opportunity that I gave some real strong thought to. And the biggest issue that I had was what would I replace this car with? Because it would have to be something really, truly special, truly different, something I really, really wanted. As it happened, there was a car in particular that I wanted and I considered buying when I bought this that I just couldn't own two years ago. And a quick search of eBay turned up one of these cars. They're very rare and hard to find. Well, I say that, when you see what it is, you'll understand more. And so somebody was selling one of these cars. So I had that holy trinity. I had somebody willing to buy my car I was in the mood to sell it and there was something available that I would have been able to afford that I want to replace the Evora with. And so I sold it, is what it is. Now I'm absolutely not leaving the Lotus family behind, no way. This channel's never officially been a Lotus channel, but I appreciate for many people that's what it is. I will be getting back into another Lotus at the earliest convenience, and I don't think it'll be one that you all expect, but I look forward to sharing it with you when it happens. Probably won't be till next year. However, until then, I'm gonna continue working with all the dealers I already have a relationship with, talking about new models, looking at what's happening, and hopefully doing a few more classic Lotus cars as well. There's still a number of esprits and things that I want to get behind the wheel of, and that's going to be great fun to do. The Lotus family have been incredibly supportive and helpful, and I really want to keep returning that favor. 
the Evora had basically run its course on this channel. You hadn't really seen a lot of content on it for a long time because there simply wasn't anything new to do with it. So that was a somewhat cynical reason too for getting rid of it. From a YouTube perspective, it did nothing for me. And unfortunately, my financial situation means that if I wanted to replace it, it had to go. And so there's a somewhat scattershot video I appreciate and not particularly structured, but that's basically how the thoughts came to me. And so I hope that explains in some small way my decision to part with this car. It was not an easy one, but it was made easier by the fact that it's gone to the right person. And you can continue to follow this car's adventures on Charlie's channel. He has a small little YouTube channel called Charlie Drives. I will, of course, link that in the description below. And of course, the car hopefully will reappear on this channel at various points in the future too, because I want to continue to chart its progress. It's one of the earliest and the most used Evora 400s in the world. So I know everyone that owns one is gonna be very keen to see just how the car fares as the miles and the years pile on. Charlie, I know, intends to use this car and drive it just like I have, and that's really, really good to see. So, I hope you guys stick with the channel and you haven't hit unsubscribe already. Thank you as always for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.